everybody. I hope you can hear me. My name is Philip Statham. I'm treasurer of the Cheltenham Gloucester branch. This webinar is brought to you with the uh, from the Cheltenham Gloucester branch and with the support from our friends at BCS HQ. So um, thank you to them for all supporting and providing the webinar facilities. Tonight's uh, webinar is uh, privacy preserving pandemic monitoring, given this time by our, the very, our own very own branch chairman, Dr. Thomas Wynne, who's been involved in security analytics and has used the expertise that he's gained in this subject to e examine the possibility of using the, the analytics in aid of pandemic monitoring. So without any further ado, I'll hand back over to Thomas Wynn for the presentation. Oh, thank you, over Philip. To you, Thomas. All right, thank you, Philip. So good, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone is um, doing well mm -hmm. and safe. So my name is Thomas, and for our webinar well evening, I like to give uh, to uh, for us to explore a little bit on the use of uh, big data analytics and it in the context of um, pandemic monitoring in a privacy preserving manner. So as far as so as an so with that in mind, this is the essentially the name of uh, the, the the title of our webinar topic today, which is going to be privacy preserving and then pan with big data analytics. My name is Thomas and I'm currently a senior lecturer in computing at the University of Right, so as far as the brief agenda for our webinar this evening is concerned, I'd like us to, <clears throat> I'd like us to little, uh, set up, set up, setting up the scene. As part of my attempts in, to set up the scene, I'd like to give a, a, give a quick overview on what big data is, what federated learning is, because as everyone knows, these two terms have been used quite widespread uh, in media in recent times, like big data big data this, big data that, but not really, when it comes down to it, we don't really know for sure what we actually mean by big data from a tech standpoint. So with that in mind, I'd like us to have a quick overview of it. And then I would also like us, I'd like to give a quick overview on federated learning and how it works, so on and so forth. And then um, I'm going to set up the scene in terms of how it applies to the current circumstances in terms of pandemic monitoring, especially with the risk, with the situation, current situation that we have found ourselves in, as well as how we leverage these two big technologies, pardon the pun, in terms of uh, in monitoring pandemic, followed by the challenges that are being considered and open research questions with a way, with a possible analysis on how they could be addressed moving forward. So first of all, when we talk about big data, so big data went up, as everyone knows, like whenever you search for big data, more often than not, you will get to see like hundreds and thousands of articles covering what big data is, what it involves, what it is, what it, what it isn't, so on and so forth. So different people have different perspectives on it, but from a technicality standpoint, when we talk about big data, Obviously, big data is not small data, that's for sure. But when we talk about big data from a technicality standpoint, we are referring to large amounts of data large that, are, that are challenging, that are challenging to be processed by traditional, traditional data processing techniques. Meaning in a traditional data processing environment, we use applications like MySQL, uh, My, uh, MySQL Microsoft Access, um, for those who use it back in the day, you might for, uh, you might remember to applications like vi uh, Visual Basic, uh, Visual Basic applications, so on and so forth. So, but when we talk about big data, so these are the large amounts of data that are that uh, that accessed by all these um, rudimentary basic applications like MySQL, so on and so forth. And in addition to that, when we talk about big data in a traditional uh, traditional normal uh, 
data and data processing environments, more often than not, data sent the data type seems to be a um, of a consistent data type. If it is a text, it is a text more often than not. But in a big data environment, it can come, it can consist of not just like text data, but also like uh, images, audio files, um, execute programs, so on and so forth. And they can be obtained from myriad of data sources, something that um, I will be touching upon in the in a couple of seconds. And then when we talk about big data, data as a baseline typically starts off with uh, starts off at the level of gigabytes. So in order for a set of data to be as big data, it needs to be um, it needs to be as a baseline level at least in the order of gigabytes. Um, order of gig not just uh, not at the megabyte level as it is traditionally used in in normal data processing environments. So when we talk about next catch, so in this case, in order to understand big data, we need to look at it in terms of a couple of dimensions. So first of all, is through the category standpoint. So when we talk about big data categories, there are three main different types. So the first type on the one one side of the spectrum we have what is called a structured data type. So a structured big data is a type of big data that has got a predefined schema. So think of it as a larger structure big data as a very large version of an Excel spreadsheet or a Microsoft um, Access database for that matter. So as a, so as everyone you would have you know, who have used either one of the two applications will will uh, surely relate to in a typical excel spreadsheet you have rows and columns and each of the columns have their um, attribute names like customer id customer name address so on and so forth and then on the rows we have different customer um, records um, so it's by having a fixed predefined schema so same similar and similar, similar con, uh, concept can still can be applied in the context of a structured big data as well. So yes, the size is big, but ultimately it has a fixed schema. It has a fixed set of rows, a fixed set of columns, fixed set of um, column names, and a fixed set of rows, um, rows, etc. And on the other side of we have what is called an unstructured data type. So a structured data type, it doesn't really have a predefined structure. So in this case, when we talk about unstructured data type, unstructured data type includes things like um, video files, audio files, um, tweets, um, tweets, uh, memes, et cetera. They are all considered to be unstructured data type. So it does, yes, it has got a format like JPEG or MP4 or and so forth but ultimately the internal content the metadata is not does not have a um, predefined schema as in the case of a data type structured data type and somewhere in between oops excuse me and somewhere in between we have semi data, big data type so in this case as the name suggests a semi structure big data shares the characteristics of both structure structure data types. So a typical example of a semi-structure big data type are going to be the XML documents. To have used um, XML data type files before you will know what I'm talking about. So in this case, in a typical XML uh, syntax, typically you have an opening tag and a closing tag. Think of it as a more customizable version of HTML, if you will. But in certain you certain cases you don't need to not all not every tag in an XML syntax needs to be accompanied by a corresponding closing XML tag. So that's 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 an example of a semi-structure uh, big data type. So in this case, when we talk about what the categories of the typical categories of a big data, so in this case it contains a myriad of uh, data types. So especially in this day and age where we have tweets, we have social media feeds, we have tweets, we have Facebook likes, et cetera, we have YouTube, we have all the video files, et cetera. 
of the day when we to call, go about collecting data, collecting big data, we can we typically find tend to find a combination of uh, combination of different data types. So, in order, so when we go about using big data, a large chunk of the, any big data project typically involves data cleansing, in which we separate the um, separate the wood from the chef, as it were. So in this case, so when we talk about, so yes, so in this case, so, so now that we got the categories down, so this is the architecture of a typical big data um, processing and the typical big data infrastructure. So this typical, this can be applied either on a cloud environment or in a standalone enterprise environment, regardless of the manner where it is deployed at, the overall concept is still the same, meaning that in a typical big data um, infrastructure is called a master node, which is a central server. And then under which we have a collection of worker nodes. So the way that a, the way that it, things work in a typical big data processing environment is that the data usually resides in the manager node, sometimes called the server. And it is the manager node's responsibility to distribute the data across the myriad of uh, across multiple worker nodes, and then each of the worker nodes will then typically uh, pro do their own processing, get their results, and then sends it to um, sends it back to the sent the manager node. So in this case, the key characteristic in a big data infrastructure such as this lies in the fact that the data that is used in this kind of setup more often than it is usually located in the manager node or the central server. Okay, so in this case, on the plus side, um, on the plus side, you can say that you know what, there's a central storage. So if you know, uh, easy for it, as far as the maintenance is concerned, it is relatively easier to maintain, and there's no um, share issues associated with sharing and such, etc. But the problem comes in when the one of the major limitations of this approach is that it presents a single point of failure. Single point of failure meaning that if the manager if the manager node is working, then it's great, we are go. But if the manager node or the central server, for whatever reason, they hold the entire big data infrastructure goes out of the window because the worker nodes will have no data to work with and in addition to that especially given these concern increasing concerns that we as general public have to us in terms of our privacy of our data and where it is used not to mention the uh, the government regulations such as gdpr etc by having all of the data stored in a central server it, it presents a huge risk to, uh, to data privacy because the central server has the complete is able to is uh, has the complete um, ability, so to say, to look up what our data is, thereby compromising the privacy of our data. So, you know, these privacy concerns, which are rightfully which have rightfully been raised out over the years due to scandals such as the uh, the chemical data uh, Facebook scandal. It makes sense. So in order to get around it, but at the same time, but on the one hand, from the data scientist standpoint, yes, we so yes, our private the you know user privacy must be uh, must be respected not just from a um, government regulatory standpoint, but also from a uh, ethical standpoint. Yes, uh, makes sense, but on the still need, data scientists still also need to have, uh, to have access to data in order to provide valuable services in uh, various purposes in this, and for the purposes of our discussion uh, webinar this evening, it would be more in line train pandemic so in this case how do we go about uh, meeting halfway 
between respecting user privacy, user data privacy on one hand, and while at the same time making the data functional, making the data available to provide, uh, to perform analytics, to provide various services. So this is where um, federated, the notion of federated learning comes into play. So federated learning was created by Brandon, uh, Brandon in Google back in 2017 as a way of as a way of uh, bridging as a way of compromising between protecting user data privacy and um, making the data available for um, available uh, available for performing analytics and such so in this setup so in this setup rather than sharing so in this case, rather than sh in, in a federated environment architecture, rather than putting all of the data in a central server, what it typically does is data is regular data. So data no longer is in a center in a single central location, but instead the data is typically will be stored across the myriad of the participating nodes. So participating nodes and each of the participating nodes will be trained using uh, will be trained using their own locally available model uh, available data excuse me and the resulting model will then be shared with the other who would then aggregate the um, aggregate all of the models from the federated nodes and then share the final global a uh, federated model in uh, across the different nodes. So the question then becomes, how does this apply to in the discussion of pandemic monitoring? So in this case, here we have in my slide, in our slide, an example of an overview of how federated learning works. So in this case, as everyone can see here, so we have we still have a central server, no doubt. But and but in this case, you can we have of hospitals hospitals it could be regional hospitals it could be local hospitals whatever the case may be and each of them will have a their own set of uh, patient data yes they all communicate with the central server but in this case they will have hospitals will store a uh, their own set of patient data and as part of their endeavors Right. So as part of their endeavors in, uh, to to provide to uh, to provide uh, patient analytics, like uh, what is the, the average age, um, the the patient patient statistics, such as like the age range, etc. They will be using their own um, locally available data in order to train a local machine learning model. So once the model has been trained. Each of the hospitals will then send their own local model, so local model to the central server. So that what this does is that upon getting all of these little local machine learning models, it will then combine all of them together, create a global model, and then share it shares it across the different. Uh, The hospitals, so that they could be used to, um, so that they could be used to further improve upon their patient analytics. So the question then becomes, how do we go about? Um, so how do we go about making sure that yes, model sharing locally available model is fine and all, but how do we go about making sure that, making sure that the model that each hospital shares is privacy preserving, meaning? that from the models that are shared by each of the hospitals, how do we go about making sure that nothing can be inferred as far as the central server is concerned from these individual local hospitals? So we will be discussing the various techniques in a, um, later on in the slide, but this is, some, this is one of the questions that we'll be looking to answer uh, for the webinar as well. But, as far as this slide is concerned, just this is just an overview of um, how a typical federated learning works and differs from a traditional big data processing environment. So long story short, in a big data environment, the data is stored centrally, but in 
machine learning architecture, data is distributed across the different participating nodes. So yes, so now that we got the, the basics out of way, so now uh, I like to set up the scene. So here is the here what here what I've got here is what we are seeing here right now is the of the COVID-19 pandemic over a 14-day period that I've got from the European Center for uh, Disease Prevention and Control as of 11, the 11th of November last year. So as everyone can see here, in the uh, based on the graphic, in this case, so COVID was uh, the impact of COVID has been quite significantly um, across the Euro across US in North America. And we have and and this and given the impact that it has um, on, on so we have experienced uh, it has impacted not just from a health uh, from a health standpoint but it also has affected um, the economics and uh, in the social nature of social operations of these countries as well. So as far so as as evidenced by the lockdowns, uh, different lockdowns, and the as far as as well as the different government-led initiatives, um, initiatives that um, that have been designed to to minimize the impact of the pandemic, but we are still seeing it nonetheless. So in this case, so yes, yeah, so an overview of it and and. The point of this, the, uh, so as far as the, the point of this diagram is concerned, so the point that I was trying to make was that, yes, given, yes, the COVID-19 pandemic has hit, has a, has had a very significant impact on the global, uh, yes, and with that, each, um, each of the countries have their own, um, has taken on their own uh, approach in, uh, in terms of diagnosing Diagnosing the uh, the disease, diagnose, um, identifying the treatment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and each of the countries that we are seeing right now will have a valuable set of data sets that could very well be used, can be sh uh, shared internationally uh, in order to collaborate to find a. Um, to, to find a possible cure as well as a, um, to share to to share across different nations in order to um, in order to figure out a possible solution um, against this pandemic. However, as everyone knows, so given as everyone knows, the patient data by its very nature tends to be quite sensitive, and it requires as such. It requires a lot of um, care in caring and such, and it's, and considering that we have regulations such as um, GDPR, and in the case of the United States, we have HIPAA. So in this case, it has proven it is not e it is not um, easy, if not impossible, for nations to share uh, their valuable uh, data across different uh, with other countries in order to identify a possible cure. So the question then becomes: How do we go about? How do we go about sharing it in a privacy-preserving manner? But we will talk about that in a minute. But before we do that, we need to look at how uh, data has been used. How private? So in this case, in order to in order to facilitate the sharing of uh, yes, there has been a lot of techniques in order that has been used proposing existing research in order to share in order for nation in order for researchers around the world to share their data in a privacy preserving manner so a couple of um, techniques that have been used include techniques like uh, secure multi-party uh, computation that's one which is where we use a, a, uh, we use different cryptography uh, primitives in order to share data, in a, uh, encrypt data and share it. And then in this setup, we, in this setup, is done on the encrypted data. Encrypted data, so the implication here is that by using, by performing processing on the encrypted data, we not only are able to get mostly um, 
approximation of the data that we would have used, we would have we would have gotten if we apply the same uh, processing on an encrypted data but from a privacy preserving standpoint we are still able to at the same time while at the same time maintaining user privacy so that's multi-secure multi-party computation is another one and in addition to that we also have other encryption cryptography based techniques such as functional encryption and so on and so forth so as far as the use of federated learning in pandemic monitoring is concerned, there are three. So FL-based pandemic monitoring has been used, generally speaking, in main areas. So one of which is in the area of predicting outbreaks. So predicting outbreaks means that based on the data that got uh, from the past, we are going to we we use it to predict. Uh, the likelihood of a, an outbreak, a pandemic outbreak, uh, possibly taking place at a given region, in a certain region, that's outbreak prediction. In addition to that, we also use federated learning in tracking pandemic spread. So given the spread, our knowledge of a spread in one area, we use it to extrapolate where and how as well as the areas that could possibly be affected by the pandemic. And not to mention, we use federated learning in, in, um, in, in identifying a possible cure, not least in the use of DNA sequencing as well as drug discovery. So, oops. So yes, so one of which is going to be one of the applications of uh, most widely used applications of federated learning along with big data, big data in pandemic monitoring is in the area of outbreak. So as I, allude, as I alluded to just now, so it features the use of geographically distributed data sets. So what do we mean by that? It basically is the use of the um, use of data that are collected by different, uh, different uh, health organizations and then using it in order to predict where, uh, where and how the, uh, the, the pandemic is going to spread. So it's, it's, it's based, it typically tends to consist of uh, time series data as well as uh, patient, data, uh, patient data and patient statistics. And, it's, and as far as uh, predicting outbreak is concerned, so typically when we talk about outbreak prediction, we typically think about okay so in this case are we so it's all about predicting whether or not um, the pandemic is going to take place in a given region in a, over a period of time but more often than not we also use it for visualizing the pandemic spread as well so visualizing means uh, providing a visual representation of where and how the pandemic is going to be spread out so so that's that's the that's typically used. Uh, so federated learning based BDA is used in outbreak prediction. Yes, but one of the challenges here is that the accuracy, how the how accurately can we how accurately can we use federated learning in order to predict outbreaks? The accuracy. Yes, we can. We uh, we can predict. We can use. We can use federated learning along with the data sets that are made, made available, data sets from international research institutes uh, to perform pandemic uh, prediction. Yes, but the accuracy, the accuracy depends on different factors, not least in terms of the accuracy of the data that we receive from the, from the different research institutions as well as the population size, as well as the infected cases, so on and so forth. So as everyone knows, so no matter how big, how accurate or how well a, um, how well designed a machine learning model is, it's only as good that is fed into it. And depending on, so in this case, yes, we can do it, but ultimately it depends on the quality of the data that we receive. And yes, we, in order, so, and all these data, are, by the way, are typically shared in different privacy-preserving uh, techniques, such as 
Monsecure Multi-Party Computation, SMC, that, uh, that I just discussed, in, along with other techniques such as differential so differential privacy is where given a set of data given a data set we introduce uh, randomness to it like noise to it it make jumble things up a little bit so that we couldn't uh, so that it is uh, impossible not impossible but at least difficult for a malicious uh, malicious attacker to perform some sort of uh, perform triangulation so trying, what do we mean by triangulation in this context? So as an example of sorts, so say, imagine that um, I've got a, just for the sake of this example, so imagine that I have a, a set of, um, a set of like data sets, data sets of the people living, um, living, living in Cheltenham along with the, um, um, along with the post where they live, etc. So without triangulation, what I so without triangulation, if I were an attacker, it is possible for me, it is possible for me to even without knowing people's names, I could use the information, the uh, the occupation data, given a person knowing his or her occupation, along with postcode, I could link to it. I could possibly, I it is possible for me to triangulate using these two key pieces of information in order to figure out where he or she lives. So that's what is called triangulation. So triangulation, uh, so in order, to over, in order to prevent the possibility of triangulation, which is, uh, which is quite, uh, which is quite uh, possible to be performed in a given a large data set, we, these are the techniques, techniques like secure multi-party computation as well as uh, differential privacy that are used. So in this case, so in this case, when we talk about outbreak prediction, yes, we can do it, but the accuracy ultimately depends on accuracy depends on the core data that we receive. But and as far as and in addition, so as far as we are concerned, so a number of uh, international uh, institutions institutions has made a bit publicly available available the data sets of course uh, it has been uh, undergone different uh, data processing tech pre-processing techniques in order to remove um, any uh, PIIs or privately identified personal uh, privately identifiable information information prior to sharing so in this case some of the well-known data sets that are that has since been um, made available in our fight against COVID-19 include the well-known uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, data repository which is made available by the John Hopkins, John Hopkins University for System Science and Engineering which is made available on websites like GitHub, as well as the data sets that are made available from websites like um, data.world. And in addition to that, uh, in addition to that, we also use federated, another area that it, where we get to see federated learning alongside, um, alongside big data analytics is in tracking pandemic spread. So in this case, as far as to that end, not only do we use the patient data that we talk about, we just saw just now, it also requires the use of a structure and structured data. In this case, it includes using data that we get from like social media, uh, social media data, as well as uh, data that we get from websites um, such as uh, such as airline tra um, airline tracking. Uh, tracking websites. So one of the key, one of the interesting examples of of application is the research that is done by Chow and his um, and his team, who use flight data, air flight data, meaning the um, the, the the data that we get from like airports, like departure times, the number, the people, um, the people who are going on the uh, on a plane, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, along with social media data as well as the publicly available, publicly available patient data. So what they did, combine all of them together, and then they were able to figure out, uh, they were able to figure out which area 
is going to uh, is most most likely to be uh, most likely to see an increase in um, infection I mean infection so it was quite interesting to see uh, the use of like com uh, multivariate data multivariate data meaning data from from in this case data from airlines data from social media because people tend to be prior to a departure people typically for the most part social media so that that data tip comes into play as well and of course all of this all of these done uh, data collection were done um, using uh, uh, by getting having um, gotten their consent and such etc and another so so yes that was what they did and as part of their research they were able to their research was able to let to the development of or a microscopic growth law which is a bio, which is a which is um, used in bio which is used in biology to to figure out the uh, the rate of a pandemic spread so it was quite nice. So they so that was one of the key examples of how uh, federated learning, along with big data, was used to track uh, pandemic. And last but not least, we also have um, pen, federated learning with uh, big data analytics was also used by uh, used in um, DNA sequencing, uh, DNA sequencing along with identifying cures for. Um, identifying if the, the vaccine against the pandemic. So because typically speaking, so when we talk about like the, uh, coming up with a vaccine try in order, typically it involves um, DNA sequencing. So DNA sequencing, given the nature of uh, processing DNA sequencing, it typically tends to um, require a lot of computational power, which if we let it to let it run on a normal run of the mill computer it will take a long time so around it in order to speed up the process in order to speed up the process of dna sequencing and thereby uh, increase the speed of uh, developing a vaccine federated learning in order to spread out so spread out the processing across the different participating nodes so for those, some of you, some of you might have heard about it, but there is, it is quite similar to, it is quite similar to a, uh, a NASA-led program called SETI. Uh, so I can't remember the, unfortunately, the long form of SETI, S-E-T-I, uh, is, um, I couldn't recall what SETI stands for, but what it does is that uh, you could actually donate, uh, and you can actually donate your computer CPU power in order to in order in order to be used by NASA in order to uh, in order to perform its uh, space uh, research. So similar concept applies here as well. So similar concept applies here as well is which was done by Ortia and Bok in their attempts to perform genome analysis using federated learning, which is where is which is where they use it to they, they use the part the participating nodes in order to process, in order to speed up the processing of genome analysis as well. So the question then becomes: so what kind of what techniques that are used in uh, privacy what are the different privacy preserving mechanisms that are currently available privacy preserving so one of them is the secure multi-party computation so more often than generally speaking in order to so the different privacy techniques that are used in pandemic monitoring involves the use of cryptography so cryptography so it typically involves the use of uh, at the most basic form it features the use of something called homomorphic encryption so homomorphic encryption is where at the most basic level of course uh, it typically involves the use of rather than processing data on uh, processing data on a an encrypted plain text the processing is done on the processing is done on encrypted 
with the goal of achieving the same results that could be received, that could be obtained as if uh, obtained on when applied to a normal and encrypted data. So we typically have, we have seen the use of uh, homomorphic encryption taking place. We have also seen the use of secure multi-party computation along with secret sharing. And in addition to that, we also have seen the use of, uh, the use of functional encryption as well. And th as far as the tools themselves are concerned, quite a lot of, quite a lot of tools, um, some of them are open source and could be used um, and can be used, uh, albeit you need to adjust it in your own user needs. But regardless of whichever privacy preserving, uh, privacy preserving solutions that we use of any of there are still a number of a uh, number of research challenges that are still considered open at this point in time one of which is first the first challenge that is still considered open is going to be the lack of standard data sets so yes uh, yes, data is, you know, data has been made available by some of the most well-known research institutions, institutions uh, in a privacy-preserving manner, etc. And has and they, and has and that sharing has resulted in a, uh, a tremendous uh, breakthroughs in terms of our our fight against the uh, the pandemic. However, the challenge here is that the standards. The data standards tend to be quite arbitrary. Quite arbitrary. In other words, there's no standard. There's no one unified standard uh, through which all the data sets are made available, uh, created. So in this case, the standard that is used by one country might not necessarily be the same standard that is used by another country, and so on and so forth. Uh, so meaning that without a proper standard, without a proper standard in we uh, we have research data scientists have to spend a considerable amount of time in making sure that the data is set to a predefined standard prior to its application. So that is one of them. So sharing data is great. Sharing data in a privacy-preserving manner is even better. But then we but there needs to be a unified global standard, uh, globally uh, internationally accepted uh, standards that uh, govern how the data format should be, what kind of information should be contained, what kind of uh, privacy preserving mechanism should be used, so on and so forth, so that data scientists don't really spend too much time, a, a lot of time really, uh, trying to like pre-process data prior to use. So that's one of them. And in addition, we also, the biggest challenge of them all is going to be the regulations surrounding data collection. So now, yes, we are concerned we have GDPR, and as everyone knows, GDP, we, uh, GDP, as far as GDPR is concerned, we have a fixed set of guidelines that we have to abide by, including but not limited to uh, regulations surrounding uh, the right to consent, right to uh, anonymity, so on and so forth, and making so. And as far as we are concerned, so as far as a data collection standpoint, we need to make uh, the data collection is done uh, in strict adherence to GDPR. In the case of us in the UK, or in the case of the United States, uh, like regulations such as HIPAA. Uh, so that's regulation surrounding is, is a challenge. And in addition, uh, which turns, and although I didn't really mention as part of the challenge, but another challenge associated with uh, privacy preserving issues lies in the fact that uh, trying to figure out what the standard privacy preserving mechanism should be. So understand there are quite a few different privacy preserving technical solutions that are currently available in existing research. But there's, uh, but as far as the standardization is concerned, there still needs to be a little bit of a, a work in terms of the standard, uh, especially as it applies to like 
applies to uh, patient data, which by its very nature tends to be um, quite sensitive. So in this case, these are the few of the open challenge, and not to mention, before I go, more to mention the performance issues associated with the existing uh, techniques. So yes, uh, right now, so as we discussed it earlier, uh, so as far as the privacy preserving mechanisms are concerned, we have functional encryption, we have homomorphic encryption, we have secure multi-party computation, et cetera, et cetera. So from a technical standpoint, yes, we have of options to choose from but all of them from a from a real world application standpoint it tend they tend to be quite um, uh, the performance that uh, they had the uh, because they typically rely on encryption which by its very nature tends to be quite computationally expensive meaning that it requires a lot of computational power on the devices on the part of the devices so in this case we need to, so the, the idea of trying to come up with an efficient privacy preserving man, uh, privacy preserving technique, excuse me, is still one of the open research questions that is still needs to be addressed. So these are a few of the, uh, few of the research challenges that, uh, that are still open as far as privacy preserving, and, uh, privacy preserving federated learning and as it applies to um, monitoring is concerned. So as far as we are concerned, so to conclude, so to say that, uh, to say that COVID-19 has had a huge impact on our, um, on, on, on a global scale is, is an understatement. And given the negative, given the impact and given the challenges that it has posed uh, to everyone, uh, to, to all the countries since really last year. A number of researchers from as far as the technical side of things are concerned, a number of uh, solutions have been proposed in order to counter, in order to deal, in order to address, in order to fight against the... Uh, and as far as our side of it is concerned, we have used it, we have used Federated, one of the techniques that we have uh, proposed as far as the computing are concerned is the use of federated learning. And more specifically, we have seen the combination of federated learning along a observing manner, privacy preserving techniques in our search, in our fight against the pandemic in terms of um, drug discovery in uh, outbreak. Uh, outbreak prediction as well as uh, spread, tracking the pandemic spread. But the challenges that um, mentioned just now is they are still uh, they are still considered an open research questions that we will still need to explore. So with that said, so as far as my webinar is concerned, so that's pretty much it. So thank you for um, thank you for listening, and now I'm open to. Uh, so let's. So here are my references, and I will make the slides available after my webinar. So, so with that in mind, so let us look at the questions. David, we, uh, Thomas, we already have one question which has been patiently asked by Rachel Coburn right from the early part of this. I think some of your talk may have addressed these points, but uh, I'll read it out anyway. How important is it to get the right balance between the following three aspects? One, policy enforcement. Two, computational privacy on data input. And three, security and protection around the manipulation of the outputs and results from the input of the original data. Yes, thank you for the que um, question, Rachel. And yes, that's a that is a very good question. Yes, enforcement. So I assume that you are referring to like enforcement of like data protection policies, such as GDPR and GDPR in the, for us um, or HIPAA. We are talking about the United States. So in this case, so yes, these are the three. Those are the three key aspects of as I are the triangles of uh, privacy, tri the tri as it were, tri in terms of uh, processing, 
privacy preserving fed rate uh, pri privacy preserving fed rate learning in, as they apply as it is applied in the context of pandemic monitoring so the way that they is in order for all three of them to work um, we will have to start off right from right at the most basic level which would be at the data point of data collection so right at the data collection we need to make sure that we adhere uh, the data collection adheres to, strictly adheres to rather the guide the uh, the regulations proposed by GDPR. So that means right to consent, etc. So that would be that right at the data collection. And upon data collection, as we we have we need to make sure that we apply the appropriate uh, appropriate anonymization technique, be it uh, be it um, Differential privacy, be it homomorphic encryption, etc. And once we manage to remove anonymize, successfully anonymize, successfully anonymize our patient data, meaning, mean, meaning that we have removed as much as we can all possibilities for triangulation, then the next step would be to figure out to identify what the most appropriate privacy preserving technique to apply so of course uh, as i alluded to earlier so it would depend on the um, depend on how computationally a intensive uh, how computationally expensive it is in other words how much computational power uh, a given privacy preserving technique requires so on and so forth and then we can go from there then so as far as the manipulation of the outputs and results of the input of the original data is concerned, um, that's a good, that's a very good point because ultimately, yes, regardless of, you know, regardless of how well intentioned we are, or that could be, it still opens up the possibility of the data being manipulated. So one of the researchers that have uh, that I have looked at recently is the possibility of using. Um, functional encryption. Functional encryption is one of them that one of the uh, possible solutions that have been proposed. So meaning that yes, right, so so it's part of what is called verifiable computing. Verifi verifiable comp so under which functional encryption comes under. So we could use techniques like this in order to address the third point. So. I hope I answer. I have answered your question, Rachel, and thank you for your question. All right. So, Thomas, can I, yes. can I ask a very brief question? You mentioned another of the techniques uh, earlier on, but I would have thought that, for example, something like homomorphic um, encryption, the processing. Right. Would be very, very um, computationally intensive. Yes, and it will. That might be a contradiction to the idea of big data. It might yes. not be. <laughs> there's, a, there's a conflict between the fact you've got a lot of data and the fact you've got a lot of computing power required. That's true. Yes. So that's a very good question. A very good point, Philip. And that's and that is precisely conundrum that we are currently facing right now. So in this case, yes, on the one hand, um, yes, on the one hand, we have like huge amounts of data. By its very nature, it's already quite computationally expensive. But on the other hand, we have techniques like encryption-based techniques like homomorphic encryption, secure multi-computation, which by their very nature, by their very nature, are already quite computationally expensive. So how do we? The question then becomes: How do we fit about? Uh, how do we meet in the middle? So one of the possible one of the possible techniques that we people have looked into is what is called a partially homomorphic encryption other than going off fully homomorphic encryption so it's partially homomorphic encryption is where we just do it we just apply homomorphic encryption like halfway so some of them so, and then so in this case half of the data will be um, homomorphic encryption could be applied on half i mean one Part will be partially applied with other uh, less computationally um, in intensive techniques such as um, differential privacy. So differential privacy being applied. 
But then again, so differential privacy is far less computationally um, expensive. But at the same time, um, we really need to be careful in terms of applying differential privacy because um, because it is not um, it, is, it still opens up the possibility of uh, people data being a, being used uh, people being able to be triangulated and identified. So it's all about so the research is still ongoing, but uh, differential privacy uh, differential privacy is more like first option, but it's still not a perfect solution. Right. So in this case, so um, hopefully I'm not pronouncing your name uh, incorrectly. Jorge uh, Aponte Gomez. Federated um, learning is a kind of uh, blockchain capability. Ah. Good question. So, federated learning is uh, federated learning on its own. Federated learning on its own is does it doesn't um, is not related to blockchain. However, uh, in recent researches, people have incorporated blockchain with along with federated learning as a way of so in this case as a way of leveraging le leveraging the immutable um, the immutable ledger part of block in order to make sure that there is a in order to keep a record of the data that is being processed so to to answer in this uh, blockchain by itself is not really used by default in federated learning it could be incorporated to leverage blockchain's uh, immutable ledger as more of a um, record keeping endeavor so hope that answer your question um Jorge. you're welcome so and chris was asking so what happens to all the process data after COVID 19. right so in this case chris i would imagine that apply with the data will still be there uh, the data as far as the data itself is concerned uh, I mean, I assume that your the data that are shared, data shared by the international research institution. So in this case, I imagine that the data will still be there, and and they will be in line with the uh, the government, the governmental data protection regulations such as GDPR and HIPAA, etc. So I would imagine that the data will still be available. Um, data will still be available, albeit in a privacy, with all the uh, PII's personally identifiable information uh, removed, like names and such, etc. And Lee was asking, so do you think the field of big data and data science has um, grown since COVID-19? Do you think society has a better understanding of data science and big data? Uh, yes. So thank you for the question, Lee. Great to see you here. So yes. So since COVID-19, I would say that prior to COVID-19, all of these the data science that are, that are currently being used in COVID-19 research has been with us for some of which some of them has been around us uh, for quite some time, such as um, sec uh, such as secure secret sharing, as well as secret sharing as well as secure party computation and functional encryption etc but what covid-19 has done is that exacerbated the uh, the use of these technologies so rather than rather than being used uh, being used uh, being being used in like research labs and computer labs it has because of the challenges that has been posed it has come to the forefront meaning that we now have we now get to see like open source software being made available open source libraries being made available uh, for these techniques like especially on sites like github etc so the tech the tools and algorithms themselves are there uh, for quite some time it's just that covid19 has uh, accelerated the widespread public adoption of these um, technologies and do you think society has a better understanding of data science? 
I would say yes. I would say to a certain extent yes, especially given the uh, the media coverage in terms of uh, data data collection scandals, like uh, such as the uh, the Cambridge Analytical case, as well as uh, as well as not to mention the um, COVID nineteen the the data the the um, the data that is being used in COVID nineteen research, so on and so forth. So yes, people, I would imagine that compared to uh, a couple of years ago, for the most part, people now have a will now have a much better understanding of um, better understanding of data science and big data, uh, big data, and that is also reflect people's growing concern in terms of where uh, where their data where their data will be used by the different uh, social media as evidenced by the mass uh, the recent mass exodus of people from uh, WhatsApp to sites like Telegraph to service Telegraph and Signal. So in this case, as far as the general so, uh, understanding of uh, data science and big data is concerned, say that society um, has a is beginning to understand it much better as opposed to um, how, uh, how, how things were a few years back, but still, there needs to be a uh, there needs it still needs to go on it still needs to go on especially given the uh, given the white with the with the wide availability of information also comes their own share fair share of uh, misinformation as well so this is the way I see it it can only get better uh, so what special precaution so John was asking uh, uh, what precautions, special precautions, excuse me, would you recommend for easily identifiable small groups, for example, like patients over 100? Yeah, thank you for the question, John. So in this case, for depends. So I would so it depends on what kind of data are you are what you are collecting from these 100 people, John. So in this case. Yes, 100 people by, by on its own is small, relatively small, as opposed to, it's not even, it's not, I would say 100 people is like the size of a small village, right? It's not necessarily the size of a town. But, but in this case, so it depends on what kind of data that you are collecting or for which purpose, more precisely. So if you are going to collect, given this 100, day, 100 people, if you're collecting data for, say, in using our case, our webinar as an example, monitoring pandemic, for example. So in this case, the data that you will be collecting from this 100 people for this purpose will be diametrically different from, uh, from the data that you'll be collecting for, say, from the top of my head for, to see like how many people are like older, how many people have a red car. So in this case, on those two examples, the data that you'll be collecting will be uh, quite diametrically different. So in this case, so depending on the, depending on what you want to collect the data from and how many data data uh, data uh, data sets that you want to collect it for, what the key point that you want to be aware of is that you want to avoid the possibility of people being identified through triangulation. So triangulation. So in this case, what you want to do is, rather than collect, so one of, uh, one way of re uh, reducing the possibility of data triangulation uh, is through like, rather than collecting a specific by specific age, uh, age for a given people. So you want to, instead of a specific age, you want to put it in a range. So instead of collecting uh, data for, uh, if you look at a, uh, a healthcare data for or Bob, for example. So instead of say Bob's age is 50, you can set it as like Bob's age is between 50 and 61. So this, by doing that, across the same 100 people, you kind of uh, reduce the possibility of that people being able to through triangulation.
Hope that's helpful, John. Uh, yes, the, uh, to answer your question, Anthony, yes, the slides will be uh, available um, after the meeting. Um, I will contact you. So, okay, cybersecurity job, okay, for some ideas. Uh, yep, thank you for thank you for letting me know, Jorge. Um, um, you got my, I assume that you have seen the emails uh, at the beginning of my slides. So here's my email. And here's my email. So in this case, for if uh, anyone wants to get in touch with me after the presentation, please send me an email to here. And yep, and Jorge, uh, please feel free to contact me and um, we can take it offline. Yeah, Thomas, can I jump in here? Sure. Uh, uh, I think we, with your permission, of course, I think it's possible for us to send the slides out to all attendees at the meeting, if that's an alternative. Uh, yes. Uh, so in this case, so what we could do, uh, Philip, is that, yes, I'm happy to share the slides. Um, I'm happy to share the slides and uh, we can share it through the main BCS, uh, BCS email listing, couldn't we? That's one way. We could send it to everybody in the branch or we can alternatively send it to everybody who attended the meeting, which is probably the normal thing which will be done. And I think we've done that in the past. All right. Yeah, we can do that. That's fine. Does anybody have any further questions or can we go to rounding up the, uh, the session? Right. So we got we got one more question from um, Chris. Oh, uh, okay. So in this case, in a, Chris was asking, in a post-COVID-19, do you think this level of data collection and processing is here to stay? Do you think? Oh, all right. So that's a very good question. So in this case, after um, in a post-COVID world, um, I would say that it would be here. To, um, um, I would say it would, there is a good chance that there is a good chance that this amount of uh, data collection uh, will be uh, will be quite prevalent. But on the plus side of it, this time around, we there will be uh, the the um, the organizations that are more um, that are responsible for the data collection will be more uh, will be more privacy aware. So in this case, so one of the things that yes, uh, one of the things that the collection standpoint, one of the things that the uh, COVID-19 has um, has caused um, has re uh, created in terms of perception, in terms of data collection, is to create a has that is that it has created a, a public awareness in terms of use uh, of data user data privacy. So with that. Well, with that in mind, so with, with that, users have become more privacy as evidenced by the, like I said, the recent mass exodus from WhatsApp to uh, Telegram and Telegram. So moving forward, I would say that the way I see it is that yes, the data collection will is still will is still will, is here to stay. But, organizations will be will also have to will also need to make sure that the manner in which they are processing the data are in line with government regulations as well as the uh, uh, ensure that the the uh, privacy preserving applications uh, techniques are applied as well so yes as far as itself is concerned it is here to stay but because of the increased privacy awareness amongst the, uh, amongst the population that is caused by the pandemic, there will be uh, companies will be uh, more careful to uh, to make sure that user privacy and GDPR adherence is here too. Would be would, could the aggregated data be used for so? Could the aggregated aggregated data be used for further data mining to help further other medical advancements? Yes, it can. Of course, it can. Um, so in this case, 
yes, uh, we could, by its very nature, like we could extend. We depending on the the depending on the features that we get from our data collection, we could apply it not just in the case of like pandemic monitoring or tracking pandemic or etc. We can use it for myriad of other purposes as well. So the Chris or as Chris Bounds was asking. Uh, processing requirements that homomorphic encryption is, that has largely prevented its widespread adoption. Could this possibly you solve is uh, if big tech were to create working solutions? Example, the effect has on the usage of uh, AES. Good question. So in this case, the long and short of it is yes, uh, right. That's a very good point, Chris. Yes, homomorphic encryption by its very nature is quite uh, computationally uh, expensive. So as such, it's kind of hard to uh, adopt. However, if, and you know, given the resources that big tech have, uh, has, their involvement would be quite great. But at the same time, it's, uh, it's, it's a classic problem of, it, the classic problem, isn't it, in terms of like who watches the watchers? You know, so yes, they're involved. They've got the resources. They've got all the uh, materials, etc. But who will be in? Uh, who is going to be responsible for monitoring? You know, these whether or not what these big tech are doing is uh, is in line is in line with uh, the government data protection regulations, etc. But yeah, the, uh, but to answer your question, Chris, it would be great. But we still need additional regulation to make sure that. He, uh, we answer the classic prop question of who watches the watchers. Any final questions before we round up the session? So, Philip, I think that's pretty much it by the looks of it. I think probably it is. So, it only remains for me to say, firstly, thank you very much, Tom, for a very interesting talk. Thank you very much for the audience for your participation and for all the interesting questions. I hope you find it inter uh, interesting and worthwhile, this session. Um, we are planning to have a, another webinar from this branch, I think, on the 13th of April. Uh, as yet, we haven't got the final, it finalised, so it's not certain. But uh, I think many of you from the local area will be aware that there's going to be a, new, a big new cyber security centre being set up in Cheltenham over the next few years. And we're get, trying to get the organisers of that project to come around and tell us a bit more about what's actually going on. That's scheduled at the moment for the April the 13th. Uh, we yet haven't got finalisation on that yet, so keep, uh, we'll keep you posted. Meanwhile, thank you very much again for, intent, for attending this session tonight. Thomas, final word? All right, so um, yes, so thank you for attending everyone. So it was great to share my research uh, on my research on privacy preserving pandemic monitoring with everyone. So um, yeah, thanks for attending and hope you have a great evening. Oh, stay safe and hope you hope to see you all uh, next month in our webinar. Stay safe, everyone. Bye.